So I'm happy to introduce the start of round two. Uh, now this is focused on improving the clinical practice of medicine. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today. She's uh, not only a practicing ophthalmologist, but uh, also is a physician scientist with a background in data science and informatics. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sophia Wang. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for that introduction as well. Um, so I'm an assistant professor of ophthalmology here at Stanford at the Byers Eye Institute. And a major focus of my research group is to use artificial intelligence methodologies on data from electronic health records in ophthalmology in order to understand and predict ophthalmology outcomes. So today I'll talk to you at a high level about our efforts to harness and develop these methodologies to bring personalized medicine to glaucoma patients. So I'm a glaucoma specialist. Uh, so treating glaucoma is a cause that's near and dear to my heart. So I know not everyone knows a lot about glaucoma, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's a leading cause of irreversible blindness, and today over 3 million Americans over the age of 40 have glaucoma. And this number is expected to double in just a few decades, um, especially as the population ages. It's characterized by progressive damage to the optic nerve. Um, and the optic nerve, circled here, it's like a cable that connects the eye to the brain. It sends all the signal about what you're seeing to the brain for further processing. And just like a fiber optic cable, it has fibers that pass that signal. And if those fibers are injured, the signal drops out and you experience that as blind spots in your vision. And it is a nerve. So once you lose vision from glaucoma and that nerve is damaged, it doesn't really regenerate. Your vision loss is irreversible. So we know that high eye pressure causes damage to the optic nerve. Um, so high eye pressure and glaucoma often go together, uh, but not always. And so there are many treatments aimed at glaucoma usually to lower the eye pressure. They include medications in the form of eye drops, laser surgeries, incisional surgery, finally, for eyes with the most advanced cases. But despite all of these treatments that we have, there's no cure. So if you have glaucoma, you know that it's a progressive disease. And then the most important thing to you will be to prevent that progression, prevent the irreversible vision loss that can lead to blindness. Now, even though the vision loss is irreversible, the course of glaucoma is quite variable. So we see here the progression of glaucomatous vision loss from early to late stages, um, both on the visual field testing, which is on top. That's the kind of testing we do in clinic to check for blind spots. And then a simulation on the bottom for what those blind spots might look like to a patient. Uh, some patients might stay at an early stage towards the left, just a few blind spots, for many, many years on just minimal medications, and that's sort of the best case. But other patients, and we don't always know why, will progress very quickly through the stages towards that advanced stage that you'll see on the right, uh, and that's sort of the tunnel vision, vision loss, that precursor to blindness. So when we see patients in clinic, uh, we want to know, you know, what kind of patient are you? Are you going to be progressing quickly or are you going to be very stable over time? So we take in and record a whole wealth of information about them, their disease history, their family history, all their eye exam, their test results. We take lots of pictures and scans. And all this information is captured in our electronic health record system, both in the discrete fields or the structured data but also in free text notes, the progress notes we write, and the various kinds of pictures that we take, the imaging. So if we could synthesize all of that data uh, into that we're collecting routinely and use that to create a predictive algorithm that could tell us accurately who our highest risk patients are, then we would know, you know who might need invasive treatments um, and who are our lower risk patients, and maybe we don't have to see them every uh, so often. So this idea sounds very obvious once we say it out loud, but a big challenge is being able to integrate all the different kinds of data that we're using into one prediction algorithm, which requires a lot of different specialized techniques, 
Um, there are many groups working on ways to classify images um, of all kinds, um, even the specialized images and scans that we take in ophthalmology that was mentioned earlier uh, in the panel. And those pictures are quite different from, say, a chest x-ray. But we're one of the only groups that's really interested on translating the latest developments of natural language processing for use in ophthalmology to look at all the information that's stored in the clinical progress note. So what's in the notes? Um, of course, these include symptoms of the patient, their disease history, family history, details of their eye exam, results of their test, everything the doctor writes about them as far as the final treatment plan. But I'll give you a really concrete example of what's really important that you can pretty much only find in the notes. So if you were a patient and you had glaucoma or you had a suspicion for glaucoma and you went into your eye doctor and they found bleeding on your optic nerve, right? That would be a huge sign that your optic nerve is in distress and you might lose vision maybe even as soon as the coming months. Just imagine, you know, bleeding in the eye sounds like a big deal and it is but it would pretty much only be in the, documented in the free tax progress notes as part of the eye exam or the assessment. Um, some doctors might try to get a photograph, but then you would have to be dilated, you have to go to the photography department to spend hours there doing this, and lots of people don't get the photo because the photo doesn't change the management, right? So there are a lot of eye exam findings like bleeding on the optic nerve that are really important for you know, figuring out how you're doing as a patient and how you'll do in the future, but they're really only in the notes. So not too long ago, the notes look like this, uh, sort of stacked in papers and manila folders, handwritten, um, but now, of course, they look more like that. Uh, very free text with very densely packed information, lots of specialized language to decode. So the question is, how can we utilize this kind of unstructured text information to figure out whose glaucoma is going to get worse? You know, you have to extract the meaning that's captured in that human readable format into something that's machine readable. So uh, as many of you will know, there, are vast, there have been vast improvements in the natural language processing algorithms over the past decade and a half. Uh, some of these have been adapted for use in, in the biomedical domain, but none of them are really tailored to ophthalmology. I know there must be a few physicians out there, and you'll know that reading a note from the ICU or from your family physician, that's pretty different from reading a note from an ophthalmologist. Um, our notes are so full of jargon and specialized abbreviations that most of the time even other doctors can't understand them, let alone kind of general AI language models or even AI language models that have seen ICU notes, for example. So we've been trying to work hard at adapting some of those models and techniques for use for our particular specialized language. That includes a couple of things. We started off updating a very simple technique called neural word embeddings which sort of maps the words into multi-dimensional vector space. And we used over 100,000 ophthalmology notes um, on the, for this and kind of could see, oh, well, glaucoma words are in one corner in blue and cornea words are in another the corner in green and oculoplastics are in red. So they kind of sort themselves into different um, areas of space, which is very nice. Um, we've also been trying a similar process uh, to train more sophisticated uh, transformer-based language models, like the BERT models, for use in ophthalmology. So using these kinds of models adapted for the ophthalmology domain, we can then try to use the clinical notes to predict glaucoma progression. But we did need to establish kind of a baseline human performance for how good we are as doctors, like how good are doctors at predicting the future, right? So we can judge how much better the models are. So you know, I went through and rated several hundred patients' notes and try to predict who's going to progress and need surgery. None of these are my patients, and my performance is there in the red X on those graphs. So for those of you who are kind of used to seeing these graphs, they're called receiver operating and precision recall graphs. And if you're not used to it, I'll just say the higher the points are, the better. And so I was a little disappointed by my performance, and I think that I'm a pretty good doctor. Um, but then you can compare it to the um, AI predictive algorithm that's looking at the same notes and making a prediction. And again, you know, the higher the curves, the better. So although they can do better, they're already kind of doing better than me. So maybe this is the beginning of the glaucoma crystal ball. If the AI predicts better than the glaucoma specialist who's going to need surgery, then maybe it can help clinicians to personalize therapies for each glaucoma patient, intervene in early high-risk patients, 
um, determine who needs innovative new treatments and needs to be enrolled in those clinical trials, relax the burden of testing on stable patients. No one wants to go to the doctor four or five times a year. If we look more closely even at what the model is using to make its prediction, we can actually see that it's some of the same things that human clinicians would too. I highlighted some of the words, the age of the patient, their particular kind of glaucoma, what else is wrong with their eye, the drugs they've tried or not tried. So that's pretty reassuring. So that was just a prediction algorithm based on just the notes. You know, what if we added all of the structured information about the patients, all their demographics, all their billing codes? Um, what if we added all the pictures we took about them? We could hope to build an even better model. So I've been trying to aggregate all of these different ophthalmology data into one collection and collaborating with others in our department so that any future researchers who are collecting their own kind of patient data might be able to link it to this collection as well. And we have folks collecting genomics data, proteomics data, and running assays on fluid collected from the eye during surgery, that's Dr. Mahajan who's doing that, or collecting data on home-based monitoring of patients, Dr. Shu and Dr. Chang are doing that. Um, and we're, we'll all hope to link it up to the same collection. In the nearer term, though, um, we're starting to incorporate the structured data, such as the patient age, the demographics and billing codes, and specific eye exam fields. We're reformulating our prediction problem so that it's even more useful to clinicians, can get a prediction at any time the patient comes into clinic, and to get even better prediction results. And preliminary data suggests that if we combine both these types of data, the results in improvement in performance over either one alone. So in the graph, you can see the curves getting closer and closer to that top left corner, which is what you want to see. And we're working on integrating the, the imaging data as well. We hope to be one of the early groups in ophthalmology to be able to fuse all these different data types together to build that crystal ball. And our efforts aren't limited to glaucoma. You know, we've been working on algorithms for low vision patients in order to get patients with really poor vision um, fast-tracked into special supportive rehab care. Um, there would be, we hope, a whole manner of potential applications for what we're trying to do. But you know, however excited I get about the possibilities of data, I do want to always bring it back to the patient, right? Checking in here at our front desk, this is our beautiful clinic building. Um, you know, this is the physical monument that houses all these tangible technologies on the left that we use every day to take care of our patients. Our slit lamp, our OCT machine, our visual field machine. These are all the tests that we're doing. But we're hoping also, you know, to build a health system that can constantly be learning from this data stream, from all the routinely captured data um, uh, that we use every day as doctors, so that we can use that data and build kind of an invisible technology infrastructure to prevent this person from losing vision. So uh, thanks so much for listening. Feel free, of course, to email me for any questions or ask them later um, in the panel. I'm always open to chat more about our research. Okay. Really exciting to see all of the work that's going on both at Stanford and other institutions and in industry. So uh, our next speaker for this section is the biomedical informaticist and physician scientist who oversees all of the data science and machine learning at uh, operations at NYU Langone Health System. So uh, here to discuss how user feedback and engagement in the deployment of predictive models in medicine. Please welcome Dr. Yindalong Afanyanafons. <clears throat> right. Hey, thanks for having me uh, come today. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today a little bit about, you know, the people that are involved in this process, right? Um, and so if there's one message you can get out of my talk, it's about let's not forget the people and the providers that are actually deploying these and how we can integrate them and think about um, the workflows that we're going to create with our models. Uh, just uh, some disclosures. Um, a little bit about NYU, we have 300 plus locations, 8.2 million outpatient visits, six inpatient locations. For a data scientist like me, this is you know, mouth-watering types of numbers, right? Because this is all things that we could use to try to build our models to do interesting things. Um, some recognition and honors. 
Uh, and most importantly, on the IT side, we're heavily, heavily invested in becoming an organization that's completely digitally driven. And that's really important because part of the success of why we were able to push te AI technologies into the workplace is because we have such a strong foundation uh, that our institution is built off of. So who am I? i uh, physician scientist. I trained at uh, Vanderbilt uh, doing machine learning stuff. I'm an assistant professor in uh, the population health, and I'm also the director of operational data science and machine learning at NYU Langone. And what that basically means is that anytime there's an opportunity where there's data that exists to do something, uh, you know, my team goes in, we have a conversation with the stakeholders, and we try to figure out if we can do something better and more efficiently with that data. Um, so I was in this because, similar to many of you, you know, I was a researcher for many years and just you know, writing papers. I was really excited about things that I was doing, but then I realized there was nothing that was translating into clinical practice. And I said, we have all these great innovations, but why is nothing actually getting into clinical care? Um, and so you know, my team and I sort of put a pitch together for our institution, and we created something called a Predictive Analytics Unit. Uh, and you know, Eric Topol talks about this in the bottom left-hand corner there, right? The corpus of AI medicine research and implementation of clinical practice. So I run a clinical predictive analytics unit. Um, our job is to provide capacity for predictive modeling, increasing operational efficiency, drive value, translate AI-based models to point of care. Uh, we lead specific projects from inception through development and evaluation. Um, so there's not this sort of divide between, well, these are the CS people over here and these are the clinical people over here. And I think that's an essential sort of structure that you need to have to make these things successful. Um, we have a master's, a PhD program, a fellowship program. You know, all of these innovations are things that don't necessarily come from us, right? It's about really teaching everyone at the institution about data science. And then they can start conceptualizing the problems that they have and how we can use that, uh, how we can uh, solve problems through, through my group. And then, you know, just a umbrella organization for uh, collaboration amongst, uh, you know, all the different entities that uh, are doing AI. I practice what we call agile data science. So this was uh, exemplified by what happened in COVID. Uh, so on Friday, we got a call from leadership you know, when the first wave was happening and said, hey guys, there's craziness happening. Can you help us? We just need some help here. Uh, and so we built our first models by Sunday and we had, our 13, we had about 13 models running in about two weeks. Um, and so out of the 13, you know, the hospital eventually chose one that they actually wanted to implement because they were solving a bunch of different problems, doing different things, um, but they weren't all necessarily ones that the institution cared about and or had interventions for. Um, so especially, you know, an adverse event model, right? That was one of the first ones that was on the radar. But leadership at the time was like, well, you know, we don't really know what to do for these patients. And so even if we had this information, would we be able to change trajectory? We're not sure. And so they really helped us to focus the time that we were gonna spend in the early phases. So my group really focused on implementation, deployment, integration, uh, and evaluation. So to, to give you a little bit of context, when I think about prediction of medicine, um, there's a big picture here, right? One of them is at the end of the day, we care about an outcome. Right? That's an outcome for a patient. There's some trajectory that we're trying to change. And the model is really just one piece of that. Right? So I might have a really amazing model. Right? Maybe it predicts readmission, maybe it predicts deterioration, whatever. Right? But there's some steps it has to go through along the way right, to actually affect clinical care. And one of them is notification efficacy. Right? So you've got to figure out a way to get this information to the person that it matters. Right? So we ran a clinical trial with our COVID-19 model. Uh, we uh, deployed that in about five weeks, and then we went into clinical trial. It took eight to nine months. We made a fatal mistake, which was that we actually let the providers try to consume this data. Right? And it was a favorable outcome model. So it was trying to get patients out quicker so that we could make space for all the influx of patients that we had. And really what we should have targeted were the CAM managers because those were folks that really cared about getting patients out the door. They really cared about getting everything in place so that patients could go. And so our notification efficacy wasn't very good, and so we lost some signal there right along the way. And then once you produce the score, right, once you produce this result, you have to motivate someone to take action. Right? So the clinician might be seeing something, and the model's telling you something, and if they agree, everyone's happy, right? If they disagree together, everyone happy. But if they have different opinions about something, right? Now you have to figure out how are you going to persuade, how are you going to get to the right answer, right? And that's not always very clear. That's a lot of the driver behind having explainability, right, in these models is because we want to reveal what the model is doing so the clinician can incorporate that in their decision making. 
And finally, the intervention itself has some efficacy. Um, and so, you know, once you put all these things together, right, you might not affect your outcome at all. Um, and so this is something that we're constantly thinking about. This is the framework that we think about as we're thinking about clinical models and employing them in practice is, you know, we have to be very thoughtful about what we're choosing because if we're predicting something where there's no intervention, you know, we're not in a good spot, right? We're not going to affect the outcome. So I'm going to motivate a little bit of an example here. I'm not going to get too much into machine learning because the really interesting thing is, is, is about the people. It's about how people respond to the model, what they thought about it. it. Did it improve care? So one of the models we built was a COVID-19 adverse event model. Uh, this is for the nurses. So it was a nursing use case. Um, and their problem was they didn't really have a way of communicating to each other about how sick a patient was. Uh, between shift change. So they came up with this rubric that you see there, right? It's a 10-point system, has a bunch of variables up there. You can see some of them are pretty redundant, right? They're probably capturing the same thing. And so this is how they'd communicate to each other. And so they came to our team and said, hey, you know, we have this tool. Can you help us? Can you build something, you know, that might be able to, to help us uh, communicate this risk? And so we did, right? So we defined an adverse event. You can see it here. Um, you know, we built a model. Uh, you know, there are different uh, predictors that you can see here, sort of, you know, standard kind of machine learning type of things. Um, it worked pretty well. You know, we built a precision recall curve, or ROC curve. We set some levels, red and orange, right, so people would know uh, what risk level corresponded to red, what risk level corresponded to yellow. Um, and then we integrated in a workflow, right? And so this is what it looks like. Um, so it looks like, you know, widget bar, you, there's a little column that you, you know, put your cursor over and it pops up with this. It shows you the, the trajectory of the patient over time and it shows you some of the factors, right, that go into it. Uh, it runs every 15 minutes. Uh, the scores are coded orange and red. Um, and you'll see in a second how we actually had green in there as well at one point, but we actually took that away because of some of the feedback we get. Uh, there are some timeouts. So if you don't have vital signs you know, in 12 hours, then the score won't appear. Right, and that's pretty sensible because you wouldn't want to be running on old data. Um, and then you can see right when you hover over it, you get the trend and top contribution factors. So who are the users, right? And what's the workflow? Like what happens when this thing fires? Uh, and a lot of times you're not really exact about what you happens when something scores. Basically nothing happens, right? If you build it, just no one will come. Um, and so this is for our rapid response team. So these nurses are responding to code events. Um, and our goal is not necessarily to change the trajectory, right? We may not be able to prevent those events from happening, but we, what we might be able to do is put them at a higher level of care so when they have the event, right, they're in the ICU and they're not on the floors. So they monitor the score column until the patient turns orange or red, a bedside assessment is made, and it's recorded in a nice Excel spreadsheet. Um, and so it's kind of old school, right, using Excel, but this works, right? So this is how we close the loop. This is how we get that feedback loop back to us so that we know what's going on uh, and how people are using it. And you can read a little bit about, you know, some of the things they put there. So what's the value, right? The value is that this is automatically calculated, right? So it's not a score that you have to do every shift. You have to count up points, right? So it's constantly just running in the background every 15 minutes. It's a quantitative assessment of risk. So it's not qualitative in the sense that we say it's high, medium, or low, right? It actually says, look, if you're red, you're at a 20% risk of having an event. If you're orange, you're at X percent of having a risk. And that's really important because it helps the providers and the people taking care of that person to understand a little bit about how risky this is and whether they should be paying more or less attention. Uh, every 15 minutes, as I said, uh, it considers the most salient feature selected features involve a predicting risk. Um, and this might seem like a really good idea, and actually, in retrospect, you know, it might not have been the best idea. There's a ton of redundancy in the EHR, right? And so we don't exploit that here, and we did this for operational reasons, right? So we did a aggressive feature selection because we just didn't want to ask for that much data from our EHR so that we could do this prediction. But you know, in real life, there's a lot of different signals happening, uh, and so you know, your model should be able to exploit all of that information and not necessarily just focus it on specific cases. And you'll see some of the caveats of what happens by doing this, where we're highly dependent on the nurses and the data inputs that they provide for this model to work. And it's definitely one failure place. 
And the nice thing about these models is it helps to elevate experience, right? This is how AI models are supposed to bring value to the healthcare system, is it helps to take someone who might not be super trained in something and elevate their experience so they are well trained. So what are some of the feedbacks? So here's one comment. Well, the green color must mean that patients are okay. Well, that's actually not true, right? It is a model that predicts adverse event. And so when they said this, we were like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. It was not designed to do this. This happened the same, the exact thing happened with our favorable outcome model, where the nursing staff was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm a nurse manager. I love this because I can look at the patients that are red, right, that are not going to have a favorable outcome, and I can figure out how to staff for the evening. And I was like, whoa, this is not designed to do that. Um, so, you know, you really have to listen closely, right, to how people are using these things. Um, discrepancy, right? I found a patient is clearly sick, but your model says they're green. How do you resolve this, right? Now, it makes sense because our model only knew about COVID patients. It didn't know about any other kinds of patients. So patients could actually be really sick because of other reasons, but our model simply didn't know what those other reasons were. And so it would only say whether they were sort of COVID green, right? Where they were green in the sense of COVID or red in the sense of COVID. Why is the BMI a risk factor, right? So people have expectations when you deploy these models about what they expect to see. So what's the answer here? Well, the answer is, is that once you're in the hospital and you have all your vital signs and your labs and other things, all those other pre preemptive risk uh, factors don't matter anymore, right? They all go away. They all get conditioned out, if you will. Um, and then, you know, people really they just want performance, right? So you say 20%, right? We get some great positive predictive value, but I want it to be even more sensitive, right? Um, and so this is a good conversation to have because it means that the nurses are understand, right? They understand what, you know, the technology is designed to do. Um, and so, you know, this is a technical issue of trying to make as performant models as possible. All right, let's see. All right. Uh, again, nurses are looking for perfect pr predictability with an unpredictable disease. Um, so you definitely have to tamper expectations. Uh, challenges reliance upon invisible factors, right? So there's this whole notion of superhuman models, right? EKG, imaging models, right? Doing superhuman things, right? And so there can be a disconnect where, you know, the nurse comes to the bedside, patient looks well, right? Oxygen looks okay. But then there's other factors that they can't necessarily see that are actually driving some of the outcome, right? And so how do you respond to that? How do you incorporate that into clinical reasoning and clinical thinking? Uh, we didn't hide scores. Uh, that was a technical issue. So, you know, this is not designed to work on ICU or, or hospice patients. Um, again, things have been changing at our institution as well. So we were getting daily labs every day. But now we don't get daily labs, actually. We don't do diffs every day uh, because it's not cost prohibitive. Well, we're not wanting to uh, spend the additional dollars for that. So how does this change the model, right? And what do we have to think differently now that this has happened? <clears throat> Um, and then, you know, there are manual, manual issues too, right? So once a patient's been identified, they're not at risk, right? They wanted to use it as a, as a full dashboard, right? Where they could remove patients, add patients, do other things. And this is, you know, all definitely reasonable recommendations, reasonable feedback, right? And we have to think about how we can incorporate this into, into our models. Some of the data gaps, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, that's really dependent on data input for nurses. So not all flow sheet rows are required for documentation. This was especially true during the crisis. So you know, things weren't required of, everything, of everybody. So if you try to run this model and the data's not there, it's just not gonna work. Um, and there might have been gaps in, in this documentation quality as we built these models. Um, and it might have confused the model and, and potentially selected as not as important features. Um, and then what's this, but you know, this model was very strong because it did actually corroborate a bit with what the humans see, right? So if a person has is on escalating oxygen status, right? That's something that at least the current status as is, right? That's what people see. And one of the feedbacks that we get was like, well, why isn't there escalating oxygen status in here? And, and we say, well, we included in the model, but the model actually identified other things, right? That were more important than the escalating oxygen status. Uh, just a couple of minutes, data distribution. We have a low sample of events, ongoing data shift, COVID-19 variants, Delta and Omicron, new treatments, vaccines. And how do we manage this? Well, we just do monthly validations. We look at everyone that has an event and we try to say, hey, you know, did the model identify that patient before they went to the ICU or had something happen to them? 
uh, and we actually provide weekly reports. Um, and you can see an example here, we get score trajectories of our patients and we try to understand what was going on and what was the model doing, right, as these things were happening. And was there value being given to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the providers? Uh, this model is available. So we thought about distribution when we built this model. We built it in Epic. So you can, if you're an Epic customer, you can actually install this model in about two or three hours. Uh, and so that's remarkable. When we were thinking about trying to distribute this work, we wanted to do it in a way that other people could leverage it uh, and use it. Has anyone installed it? The answer is no. <laughs> uh, you know, getting people to understand and, 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 and find the value in these tools are still require a ton of work. Right? We wanted to do the randomized control trial for this because that's the gold standard, uh, but we just don't have enough volume now. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. So how does it improve clinical practice? I think my ending note here is that we don't know. Um, you know we have qualitative experts that are, that are you know, interviewing some of the users and other things to try to find where the value is, um, but we don't know. And you know, I think as we deploy AI models in clinical practice, right, we have to really come up with right designs, right workflows, and really understand the whole pipes from end to end to really understand what value are we bringing and as well make sure that we're not hurting our patients. Huge team and uh, thank you. Please send me an email. I'd love to hear from you and love to hear your stories as well. Thank you. <clears throat>
And I think that's what our job is, to try to make that connection of how do we deploy these machine learning models to help clinicians and not hurt them. So really about not replacing clinicians, but about helping them. So if we take a look at the literature that's out there um, on uh, machine learning and medicine, you'll, you'll, the, the titles are great. And I, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, right? Uh, our model does better than an expert level ophthalmologist at, at uh, diagnosing diabetic retinopathy. Our EKG arrhythmia algorithms are better than an expert cardiologist. Our algorithm is better than a pathologist, better than an emergency physician, right? This is a nice benchmark. It makes for a great paper. It gets you a really high like, citation count. It's great, right? But is that really the, um, is that really the bar that we have to get over? Right? It makes a great headline, but is that really good enough? Um, so let's, um, uh, let's take, for example, um, self-driving cars. Right? They're, they're kind of out there. They do quite well. And just like in medicine, they do better than humans. Right? Humans are extraordinarily error-prone. We get into car accidents all the time. And I think we can provably show that these AI drive models already do better than humans at driving, right? Uh, ignoring some of the you know, edge cases and all, all those other issues, right? But if we, just, if we just go by the numbers, AI is already safer than humans, right? But after the, after the first or second car accident, right, they were taken off the road. And that's, what, that's what's going to happen in medicine as well. Right, and so that, that gives us a pretty nice roadmap, uh, nice pun, um, of how we do deployable machine learning. That just because it's better than humans, that is not good enough. And I'll tell you why. Right. So um, let's say you're uh, you're at this hospital. You're in this nice group. You know the radiologist. You went to like you had barbecue at their house this last weekend. And he missed a lung nodule. I can't believe it. Right? But you know what? He's a good guy. He talks to his patients. He's really caring. You know? And so that's, that's, that's OK. You know, we're going we're gonna to brush out the rug. You know, he, like, I would have missed that, too. I don't, I don't know if I would, but I, I would have missed that, too. And so that's, that's a pass. Right? And this other surgeon, he's really good with his patients. Like, we love him. Right? And so like, that wasn't a missed breast cancer. Like, the, the patient didn't present right. They just, they just lied about their symptoms, right? So when humans make mistakes, we, uh, because they're our colleagues, because they're human, we make excuses for them. And we allow, we tolerate a much higher level of um, failure than we do for machines. When a machine makes a mistake, how many people are going to jump to the rescue of this machine? Like, Oh, this, this machine learning model, yeah, it's really great. Like, I, I had um, dinner with it last night. No, I don't think so. Like, I, you, just, you just won't, right? And because of that, the standard for machine learning models has to be much, much higher. So um, machine learning is, has really advanced you know, over the last decade or, or more. But it's still not perfect. It's nowhere near perfect. And until it becomes 100%, unless you, until you have 100% precision, 100% recall, it's, it's, you can't just wholesale replace humans. So on one side, you have um, human-only clinical workflows, no machine learning model, model uh, no machine learning at all. And on the other side, way over here, you have 100% machine learning, no humans at all. Right? And so great. One day we'll get there, we'll have, like, perfect, uh, we'll have perfect models, and we can go completely autonomous machine learning. But until that happens, um, we have to do something in the middle where we have a human in the loop. And so what does that human in the loop mean? Well, it could be something like suggestions and things, but I'm going to kind of think about this a little bit differently. So um, I, uh, I'm, gonna eat, I'm probably going to like uh, date myself right now. Uh, how many of you guys have, had, uh, have used like the old school phones and like text message, right? Where you only have like nine digits or yeah, yeah, 10 digits, right? And to get like, to like spell something, it's like two, like twice to get a B, 
Uh, you have to press five a couple times, and like you got really good at like pressing really quickly, right? And so those were those were bad days, right? It took you forever, and then we we came up with like certain language because we hated writing like characters, and that's kind of like where medicine is now, right? So eventually we came up with like the T9 system, and we predicted the next letter based on uh, like the combination of letters you had, and that was great. We were able to write a lot faster. And then later on, we decided, well, let's have keyboards and things, and let's have predictive autocomplete, and that's what you have on your iPhone or uh, Android now, right? So what if we use that same type, and I guess, uh, and then eventually we had Siri dictation, and we, don't, we didn't need to like type it all. So imagine if we did the same thing with medicine. So let's take one of the most common clinical tasks, the most tedious of them all, which is electronic documentation, right? We all, we all hate it and uh, it's, it's quite time consuming. So what if we use that as a target for the machine, mo machine learning models that we are currently, um, that we're currently training? And the, the nice thing about this is it allows for this gradual evolution of clinical deployment rather than like a wholesale replacement. So instead, why don't we slowly add more and more machine learning in? So we, we did this. We, we had a real tough time in the emergency department of getting our uh, nurses to enter chief complaints. So you come into the emergency department, you'll tell them a story, and then they will, they will categorize it with a chief complaint, like you have chest pain, you have abdominal pain, uh, you, have, uh, you fell off a, a scooter, uh, you got into a car accident. And um, before we started using machine learning, we had a 26% um, structured data capture rate. So only 26% of the time, they would actually pick one of the things that we wanted them to pick, and the rest of the time, they're like, oh, no, 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 like, they're, this, this, this patient's special, and I'm gonna make up some other chief complaint that doesn't exist, right? And that's the human thing to do. Uh, also why it's really hard for you guys to train models, because uh, we really hate doing structured data capture. So what we did instead is we said, well, why don't we take this, um, this notion that we had from um, cell phones, from text messaging, and why don't we apply machine learning the same way? So rather than giving, some, giving them a blank list, why don't you use the machine learning model to order their autocomplete based on their predicted probability of them having that chief complaint based on all the other data, right? So that take, let's take that classification um, problem that we've been training the model for and use that to drive the autocomplete. And by doing so, we were able to change our structured data collection rate to around about 25, from 26% to 97%, right? And uh, so really, really good. And in fact, uh, was statistically significant of improves, improved quality and improved completeness. And so the real test here is not, well, did we get better structured data? Did we get better quality data? Uh, did we get better satisfaction? No, no, no. I'll tell you the best litmus test for these types of algorithms is when your machine crashes and that uh, machine learning is taken away. Then you get lots and lots of angry emails and phone calls saying, why is the system so slow? Well, let me tell you, there is no difference in system responsiveness. What we're really saying is my workflow was substantially longer than it was with the model. So you've made my life more efficient and faster, and now it's slower. Oh, and by the way, uh, none of the nurses actually knew there was machine learning. We just kind of, uh, it was all transparent to them. So they didn't even know, uh, they were completely blinded. They didn't know if machine learning was helping them or not. All they saw was um, the, what was coming down. So by doing it in this way, we showed a 95% reduction in keystrokes, which amounted to over 90 man hours per year by just implementing a classification algorithm. So this, isn't, this wasn't some like magical machine learning method. What it really was was how do we deploy the machine learning, the, the out of the box machine learning that we're already doing to standard workflows and we attack the most annoying, most meddlesome parts of our workflow in a way that is safe, right? Because even though it might have a precision of only 0.7 or 0.6, who cares? Because the opposite is, uh, without the model, they have nothing. And you still have the human kind of correcting. Um, we did the same thing for, uh, so now you have, you know, entering one structure data element. 
Now, imagine you do that for the entire documentation scheme, where you're free texting entire notes, and um, the machine learning predicts at the time of writing of any letter that you, uh, any keystroke that you hit, the next word or sentence or paragraph that you're trying to do. And as a benefit, now all of your data is structured. So yes, absolutely, we should build better methods of doing natural language processing, uh, better embedding models, you know, absolutely. But wouldn't it be nice if we use those same models to collect high quality data to begin with, and then we can train better models? So, um, so a really different way of kind of thinking about how, how, we, um, how we do this. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of sum it up here. I, I just gave kind of one example of um, kind of our, our work. Um, but how do we, but I think the overarching theme is how do we transform clinical, and machine clinical medicine using machine learning? And it really is, if we, re if we re kind of tweak that, how do, we, how do we use machine learning to make the right thing easier to do? Because if you make the right thing easier to do, people will just do it. You don't have to incentivize them. All you need to do is make it easier, and they'll just, they'll just naturally do that instead of the harder thing. And by making those the right thing faster and more efficient, our workflows in medicine will become more reliable and safer. And so I did there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Horn. So at this point, I'd like to invite all of the uh, round two panelists to come up and join me on the stage. Uh, we'll get started with this Q&A. So a quick reminder to the audience, feel free to come line up at the uh, mics at the front of the room. For those of us, uh, those of you who are joining, let me, you can have my seat. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, for those of you joining from uh, online, feel free to drop your uh, questions in Slido and you can uh, use the uh, designation at doctor, for example, at Dr. Wang if you have questions directed toward a particular panelist. Uh, so to start us off, I've got a question uh, in the chat. So for those of you who've actually deployed your uh, models in a clinical setting, what pain points or unexpected surprises did you encounter? You want to go again or I'll, uh, I'll go. All right. Um, so um, as much as you try in um, your interrogation phases of your models of finding edge cases and other things, um, you'll never find them all. And um, when you deploy these models in real life, uh, you really find all the use cases because you see every single case that gets, uh, that there's a problem, you hear about them and you go, oh right, the model never see, has never seen this before or, uh, or what's usual is, why would someone enter that in that space? That is not like, that is not where you put that data. Uh, there, was a, there is that part where you put that data. There is a box where you put that data that gets right underneath it. Why would you switch those two? It makes no sense. Um, but that's, that's real life. And so um, the, uh, it's said in a different way, your test data uh, rarely ever fully looks like your, your training set. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, right, data input is so important to these models. You know, when, you know, based on what Steven said, if someone, you know, misplaces a heart rate for blood pressure or, you know, whatnot, like, it will fire, right? And someone will get that, get that information, right? And then it becomes a false positive, right? And then you're adding the false positives. And then, you know, you're dealing with alert fatigue. And so, you know, it's really hard. You know, we have individual conversations with everybody in every one of our applications. Right, as we try to scale, as we try to get these things going. Right? And we're in the initial phases of scaling now, right? because we have two other hospitals that are, that are going to be part of the NYU system. And we don't have a good playbook about how we go there and not have every place be a custom you know, job, basically. And that's what we really want to get to, is you know, moving toward a, a, a vision where you know, I can go into a hospital, I can tell them like five things, and then boom, you know, there's no other questions that are needed. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the hardest problems we're dealing with right now is the social, the social technical aspects 
of generalization, right? Technically, we can do it. You know, just get the population. I can generate AUC, precision recall curve, all that kind of stuff. But the workflows themselves, right, are totally different. Uh, and how do we manage that? How do we come up with a playbook that's not doesn't have to be generated every time? Right. Absolutely agree. So. Uh, Related to that point, I guess when you're deciding whether a machine learning model is worth adopting into the clinical workflow, what kind of threshold do you use for performance? How do you determine that threshold, i.e., how good does it have to be in order to justify adoption? Right, well, I can speak to this as I talked about how much better my AI models are compared to myself as a doctor. Although if, I, if you had asked me before I started rating, I would never have told you that the models would be better than me as a doctor. I'd be like, oh, well, of course. Well, look at these terrible models. I'm, sure, I'm surely better than that, right? So I think some of, the, some of the figuring out what the threshold has to be is also a conversation with the folks that you want to use your model and kind of a sense of, you know, how, their sense of like, well, how good are their predictions? How would this help? Um, how, how would this help the doctor in the clinic, essentially? So I think there's a little bit of convincing that needs to, needs to happen um, and demonstration that what you've done, even if it isn't perfect or not you know, superhuman or not 99% AUC, that it can still be uh, helpful in certain contexts. Certainly, and there are a lot of other considerations right, to take into account. For example, with your users, you know, how much time, for example, is it gonna save on a case? And, how much money you know, is it going to save, right, the hospital? And I guess from my personal experience also um, testing out these models on clinical workflow, I found that oftentimes, you know, even if you have a model that's got a very high AUROC, let's say you know, 0.98, when you actually deploy it, there's so many human factors that come into play, right? You know, for example, if your user doesn't trust the model, then they're going to be double checking the model's predictions anyway, which means their turnaround time is going to double. And so there's certainly a lot of considerations beyond uh, just you know, machine learning model performance. Um, this, and, yes. Uh, I just wanted to add to that too. You know, it's really important that you understand what the interventions are going to be. That, and that's really what drives your threshold, right? So we have a, an advanced care planning, you know, similar to here at Stanford, a two-month mortality model. And so we tune that to 75% positive predictive value, right? Which means when the clinician sees it, right, this patient has a 75% chance of dying in the next two months, right? And we chose that because that was a threshold that we knew was soon enough where a stop would be warranted to think about the things that were happening to this patient, not just in advanced care planning, but also other interventions that might be happening. Right? And that seemed to be short enough right, where this was imminent, but not so long at six months to a year where you'd still sort of do the same things. Mm -hmm. right? Another example is um, an a, a, a obesity prediction model for children. So we had you know, a model that would take, at two years, predict whether the patient would be obese at five. Right? There were some patients in that cohort where 95% chance that that patient would be obese at five. Right? And so if you communicate that to a clinician, right, they might be willing to take more aggressive approaches and aggressive interventions than if you're saying, oh, you know, there's a 50% chance. Right? And so there are thoughts around caloric restriction and other things, which are just completely not unheard of. Right? You wouldn't do that um, normally. Um, and so it's really important to think about what you're going to do with the model, with that information, and you tune the threshold right, to what would it take for someone to achieve that outcome even if it's a low sensitivity, which it probably will be at some of those higher positive reading values, that's totally fine, right? Because you're trying to drive the right decision in certain use cases, uh, and that, if that's the threshold that it takes to drive the decision, then that's the threshold that you need to set the model at. And I'll piggyback on that. Sometimes you know what the intervention is, a rehab program, a whatever it is, but you might not always know, like, you, know, some, you might even know the cost of the intervention per patient, right? But there might not be measurable data for what is the benefit to the patient. You know, like how do you measure the dollars and cents of quality of life years or whatnot, right? So that makes that kind of cost calculation very difficult. And, you know, we just have to go with what we have and, and then we have to go out and collect that data too. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have some uh, in-person audience questions. 
Hi, Estia Osmanli from the Montreal Children's Hospital. I was curious if you've had any experience with patient-reported outcomes, so using predictive analytics projects um, trained to uh, predict some of these outcomes that could be perhaps most meaningful to, to patients, and do you think that could have an impact on uh, sustainability, uh, acceptance, uh, and user engagement? So, um, yes, you know, uh, especially in orthopedics, right? We have tried to create prediction models that before the surgery, you know, will predict what the pain scores might be afterwards and other things. Um, you know, we, the performances weren't high enough where we felt like, you know, it might have changed trajectories and or if there's anything that would have been done differently. Now, that having been said, it's, we didn't spend a ton of time on it. Um, you know, as we're selecting projects, you know, we try to be very agile in terms of just creating baselines as fast as possible to try to understand how much R&D is required. And if there's any point that there's a lot of R&D required, then we say, okay, well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, we're going to get students or other people, you know, who have sort of longer bandwidths, right, to do. Um, but yeah, there's a whole set, and also in neurosurgery, there's a whole set of, you know, patient-reported outcomes that we would like to predict um, but for us, it's not about the individual task as much as having the engine that can answer essentially all tasks, right, in a very quick way so that we can sort of, you know, quickly see where the opportunities are uh, and be able to build interventions around them. That's really a great question. Looks like we have one more in-person question. Hi, thanks. Uh, Daniel Yang from the Moore Foundation. Um, you know, Yin, you'd, you'd mentioned in your talk um, this interesting finding of you put your app or you put your model on the Epic Orchard and zero people downloaded it. And to me, it's almost reassuring because I think what I've heard is just the importance of this social technical nuance when it comes to implementation. So my question is, if you're assessing a model that was developed outside of your system, do you apply a different lens or set of practices to implementing it than those that are developed within your system? I mean, I think that's the core scale question, right? That's, that's the issue, is what is generalizable, right? So certainly the model itself is not necessarily generalizable off the bat, right? Because we have our patient population at NYU. All you all have your patient populations here. So that's always, you know, sort of uh, implementation science 101, right, of doing that part. I think the second part is what do you tell this new organization that wants to deploy your model, right? And all I can tell them is how we have deployed it right, what our processes are. We have these model fact cards that, you know, pioneered by Mark here in front that we create that tell you all about the model and what's going on internally and other things. Uh, but we also add to it because we add all the things about the workflow, right? So in this case, we had rapid response team. Well, maybe there's a corollary, right? Some of the uh, uh, workflows are very centralized, right? So there's like the a central organization gets the alerts, right? And then it gets distributed to providers. Um, and so I don't know what the right answer is, right? Because one thing that's gonna hold this back is unless we figure out the right language to communicate between organizations about what we're doing, every model is gonna be you know, a slog <laughs> to get going. But maybe that's just the way it is because it's nothing special about AI in medicine versus straight up clinical decision support in medicine, right? And that's just the story. Right, that 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 uh, that exists right in our universe. And maybe we don't want models that generalize to everywhere. You know, yep. maybe that's not the goal, right? We, it's not the same as looking for scientific truth that is true across you know space and time for everyone, right? Well, you you want the model that works for your population when you're trying to implement it. So maybe the lessons that are not just exactly what are the weights in this model that have been published, but how the implementation was done and, and all of that kind of um, associated infrastructure that went with it. Yeah, I think that the um, you know deploying these models is is a lot of work. Um, and can sometimes be just as much or more work than developing the models. Um, and so for me, when I look at external models, it's, well, is, it, is, is what they did um, worth uh, taking their model and fine tuning it for our institution? Or is it better just to redevelop the entire thing from scratch and get better, you know, get performance off the bat? Um, and so that's kind of the, that's kind of the difficulty, at least, in, you know, because, their population is likely very, very different 
Um, and not just because we live in different like areas with different people. You know, our institutions probably specialize in very different things. Um, at the Bethesda Deaconess, we have a lot of liver patients. We have almost no heart transplant patients, but we have a lot of liver patients. We have all the liver patients of all of Boston. Um, and uh, I'm sure NYU has very similar specializations where each tertiary center has one thing in particular that they're really, really good at. Absolutely. So um, fortunately, we're out of time for this panel discussion. Uh, but I definitely encourage the uh, both online and in-person attendees to please enter your questions in Slido and stay in touch on, uh, on Twitter. All right, so I think now uh, I'm going to give the mic to Akshay to introduce our uh, next industry panel. But thank you again to uh, Dr. Wong, uh, Dr. A, and Horn for the stimulating discussion.